Wafarong. Wafarong, also called the Wafarong, Wadawurung and Wadawurung, are an Aboriginal Australian people living in the area near Melbourne. They are part of the Kulin Alliance. The Wafarung language was spoken by 25 clans south of the Werribee River and the Bellarine Peninsula to Streatham. They were sometimes referred to by Europeans as the Barable people. The area they inhabit has been occupied for at least the last 25,000 years, with 140 archaeological sites having been found in the region, indicating significant activity over that period. The Wathurung Aboriginal Corporation, a registered Aboriginal party since 21 May 2009, represents the traditional owners for the Geelong and Ballarat areas. One to although there is considerable internal disagreement between the two regional groupings, which regard themselves as heirs to culturally and linguistic distinct groups. The Wafarong Aboriginal Cooperative, based in Geelong, also has a role in managing Wafarong cultural heritage, for example through its ownership of the wordy Yuang Aboriginal stone arrangement at Mount Rothwell. Language Wafarong is a Palmanungan language belonging to the Kilin sub-branch of the Kilinic language family. Country. Wafarong territory extended some 3,000 square miles, 7,800 km2. To the east of Geelong their land ran up to Queenscliff, and from the south of Geelong around the Bellarine Peninsula, towards the Otway forests. Its northwestern boundaries lay at Mount Emu and Mount Misery, and extended to Lake Burrumbeek Beaufort and the Ballarat Gold Fields. History European Invasion Coastal clans of the Wafarong may have had contact with Lieutenant John Murray when he charted Indented Head and named Swan Bay. Matthew Flinders met several Wafarong when he camped at Indented Head and climbed the Yu Yangs in May 1802. When Lieutenant David Collins founded the colony at Sullivan Bay, Victoria, in October 1803, he sent Lieutenant J. Tucky to survey and explore Corio Bay, which resulted in several Aboriginal people being shot and wounded. William Buckley, a convict who had escaped from the abortive Sullivan Bay settlement in December 1803, lived with a Victorian Aboriginal group, commonly identified with the Wathrong. In his reminiscences, Buckley tells of his first meeting with native women. Buckley had taken a spear used to mark a grave for use as a walking stick. The women befriended him after recognizing the spear as belonging to a relative who had recently died and invited him back to their camp. The tribe thought he was the resurrected Marengurk, an important former leader. He was adopted into the horde and lived among them for 32 years, being treated with great affection and respect. Buckley states he was appointed a headman and had often witnessed wars, raids, and blood feuds. He adds that he frequently settled disputes and disarmed warring groups on the eve of some fight. As a revered spirit, he was banned from participating in tribal wars. According to Buckley, warfare was a central part of life among Aboriginal people in the area. The European settlement of Wathurong territory began in earnest from 1835, with a rapid arrival of squatters around the Geelong area and westwards. This European settlement was marked by Aboriginal resistance to the invasion, often by driving off or stealing sheep, which then resulted in conflict and sometimes a massacre of Aboriginal people. Very few of the reports of the killing of Aboriginal people were acted upon. On the few occasions the matter did reach court, such as the killing of Woolwigin on 7 October 1836, following which John Whitehead was sent to Sydney for trial. The case was dropped for lack of evidence and the absconding of key witness Frederick Taylor. At the time Aboriginal people were denied the right to give evidence in courts of law. The incidents listed below are just those cases that have been reported. It is likely other incidents occurred that were never documented officially. Writing on 9 December 1839, 
Neil Black, a squatter in western Victoria, describes the prevailing attitude of many settlers. The best way to procure a run is to go outside and take up a new run, provided the conscience of the party is sufficiently seared to enable him without remorse to slaughter natives right and left. It is universally and distinctly understood that the chances are very small indeed of a person taking up a new run being able to maintain possession of his place and property without having recourse to such means sometimes by wholesale. In 1841, Wafarong Man Banjan or Banjan was charged with murder for killing Yamoing of the Gilijin people whose territory bordered that of the Wafarong. According to the Wesleyan missionary Francis Tuckfield, one of the witnesses in the case, Banjan had been in contact with Europeans more than any other member of the Wafarong, having even been a volunteer member of the native police for some time. According to police magistrate Foster Fyans, Banjan was with the native police for seven months, tracking runaway horses and generally assisting the other members. The prosecution alleged that on or about 14 July 1841, Banjan shot Yamoing in the head with a carbine at Geelong, killing him. The prosecution ultimately abandoned the case and Banjan was eventually discharged. The case in the Supreme Court of New South Wales for the District of Port Phillip, R.V. Banjan, later become notable for the legal question of whether the colonial courts had jurisdiction over offences committed by Aboriginal people inter sea that is, by one Aboriginal person against another, and the legal situation as to the British acquisition of sovereignty over Australia and its consequences for the Aboriginal people. The events of the 1854 Eureka Rebellion took place on Wafarong land. Three Wafarong clans lived in the vicinity of the Eureka diggings, the Burrumbeet Balloch at Lakes Burrumbeet and Learmonth, He Balloch, a subgroup of the Burrumbeet Balloch at M.T. Buninion, and the Tulora Balloch at M.T. Warrenhape and Lal Lal Creek. The early policing of the Ballarat gold fields was done by the Native Police Corps, who enforced the collection of the gold miners' license fee resulting in confrontations between diggers and the gold commissioner, considered by some historians, such as Michael Cannon and Weston Bate, as preludes to the Eureka Rebellion. There is oral history that local Aboriginal people may have looked after some of the children of the Eureka miners after the military storming of the Eureka stockade and subsequent massacre of miners. Although not corroborated by any written sources, the account has been deemed plausible by historian Ian D. Clark. Some further credence, although circumstantial, may be provided to the above information. George Ewell, older brother of William Cross Ewell, was not only liked and trusted by the local Aboriginal people, together they had at least one child, also named George Ewell. George Ewell Sr. died on 26 March 1854. He was at the time of his death a storekeeper on Specimen Hill and hence he was among the miners. Whether his wife was with him is unknown, but it is a fair assumption that the local Aboriginal people would have been very familiar with the miners, especially if they were in constant contact with George Ewell. One Learmonth brother in particular was implicitly aware his shepherds were using skulls of Wadawurrung people on stakes to ward people off his property. Willem Bonnick was the last surviving member of the Wafarong to witness colonization. Structure, borders, and land use. Communities consisted of 25 land-owning groups called clans that spoke a related language and were connected through cultural and mutual interests, totems, trading initiatives, and marriage ties. Access to land and resources by other clans was sometimes restricted depending on the state of the resource in question. For example, if a river or creek had been fished regularly throughout the fishing season and fish supplies were down, fishing was limited or stopped entirely by the clan who owned that resource until fish were given a chance to recover. During this time, other resources were utilized for food. 
This ensured the sustained use of the resources available to them. As with most other Kulin territories, penalties such as spearings were enforced upon trespassers. Today, traditional clan locations, language groups, and borders are no longer in use, and descendants of Wafarung people live within modern day society, although still preserving much of their culture. Clans. Before European settlement, 25 separate clans existed, each with a clan headman, who was called an Arweet among the coastal Wafarong and a Nuranit among the inland northern tribe. Arweet held the same tribal standing as a Nguringita of the Wiringiri people. Customs. According to William Buckley, the Wafarong practiced ritual cannibalism, Moderately compared to what he reported of the practices of a neighboring tribe, the Paladur Baron, whose putative cannibalism is itself dubious. Buckley claimed enemies slain in combat were roasted and eaten. Alternative names Bengali Horde near Geelong, Borumbeet Block Horde at Lake Borumbeet, speaking a slight dialect, Buninion Place name, location of a northern horde. Waduro, Wadawio, Waderer, Wadurong, Woloirong, Wadoro, Wajiriru, Witawarong, Wathawirong, Waterong. Wajiriru, Wadiawaru, Wadiawara, Wituro, Witiohiurong. Watharong, Waitarong, Watharong, Wadarong. Wara, Wardi Yalak Horde in the Pitfield area. Witaoro. Witoro, Witura. Wajirirong, Witoirong, Witoirong Source, Tyndale, 1974.